Welcome to Got to Run with Will. My name is John Hunterkamp, your host of this episode, and our guest today is John Troutman. John has been running all his life, and I met him back in the, the 80s, and he was a world-class high school athlete, and he graduated to Georgetown University uh, and competed there, made an Olympic team, took a little break from running, and then got back into running as a coach and as an elite athlete again. So we're going to talk about those three chapters of, of John's running and non-running uh, life. And I'm excited to have you here, John. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So I, we come from the same state. I went to Shamrock High School in Long Island. You're from Monroe Woodbury. So it's probably yeah. section... Section 9. Okay. So I first saw your name in the record books because I was about six or seven years behind you. And all you could see is John Troutman, you know, whether it was the State Cross Country Federation meet, I think one of the more famous high school races that you've run was that 3,000 meters at uh, the Penn Relay is your senior year. So tell us how you got into running in Monroe Woodbury and then a little bit of your highlights from high school. Yeah, sure. Well, I actually started, started running mostly because my dad was a runner back in the day. He did the New York Marathon a few times, ran the Boston Marathon, and he was really into running and kind of wanted to get me into it. Uh, I didn't really like it in the beginning. It wasn't fun. You know, he dragged me along at some of these uh, road races, the local races and whatnot. And, uh, you know, I tried to stick with them and I would not be having fun at all and be complaining the whole way. But eventually I found myself uh, doing pretty well. And the big, uh, I guess, one of the moments of my of my early, early career, career, but my early experiences running was in sixth grade uh, field day. Okay. Where we had a 400 uh, meter run on grass. And uh, I went out, I fell down, everybody got way in front of me, and I uh, ended up getting up and, and beating everyone. And, uh, you know, then I was like, wow, this is kind of cool. If I can beat people, winning is fun. Was that kind and of running, an aha moment? Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of was. I still didn't really enjoy training. Right. You know, that took some time to get used to, but... But the actual competing and winning was something that I enjoyed from right off the bat. Now, did you play other sports and like other sports? Well, I played Little League. I played uh, CYO basketball. And I, I really love playing basketball. Okay, that was your sport. Um, yeah, I played basketball through eighth grade. And uh, I kind of wanted to play in high school. But, uh, you know, after my first cross-country season, you know, that was not going to happen. I was, I think I was 10th or 11th uh, in cross-country my, my freshman year. At the state level. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's either the state meet or the intersectional meet, federation okay. meet. Excuse me, the intersectional meet or the federation meet that I was 11th. I believe it was the state meet. Okay, yeah, because I know in high school, typically this on the boys' side, the seniors are winning, maybe a junior. It's very rare that you have a freshman or sophomore make any damage on the state level. On the girls' side, that's a little bit different. You have sometimes the 7th, 8th graders, ninth graders kind of running really well. But for guys, we're a little bit delayed. And I feel like, yeah, so as a freshman... I, that's phenomenal. And obviously, as a sophomore, you said you were runner-up? Yeah, was, my freshman year, things kind of, after cross-country, things actually went on a little better in my, you know, I thought 11th or 10th in the in the state was great. Indoors, I ended up setting uh, a national record uh, for the mile, age group record, not a freshman record, right. a 14-year-old record. In the mile, I think it was 422 or 423. Wow. And then outdoors, uh, I ran 403 in the 1500, which is, at that time, was an age group record. Um, and also, actually, this is another, uh, you know, fact that, p that people don't know that I, I actually ran my one steeplechase okay. as a freshman at Randall's Island. It was the, uh, I think it was the Eastern State Meet. And I forget what I ran. I think it was around 940, 40 something. But I set a national age group record in that race, too. I actually tied it. Oh, I wow. tied a national age group record. Um, stepped on all the barriers <laughs> until the last one. I tried to hurdle it and uh, hit my knee, did a somersault, and uh, finished, because it was only about you know 50 meters left. Right. And uh, yeah, I tied the national record, but that also ended my, uh, my freshman season. Yeah. You seem to have a history of stumbling and getting back up. It's actually a good segue or kind of theme yeah. to, especially starting off the mile, because we'll get to it a little bit later, but you had success at the mile as, as a 46-year-old. Um, but yeah. we, wanna, we don't want to jump yeah, ahead really yeah, that yeah. quickly. So yeah, again, you were running very well. And the, I think, again, I would say, and forgive me if I'm wrong, the 3,000 meters at Penn where you ran 8.05, breaking Steve Prefontaine's record. I think he had it for 16 or 17 years. You break yeah. it now. I think when he ran it, he probably had a little more company uh, where he was out, you know, maybe a race where he was kind of battling folks. Maybe they were older, but yeah. you come along, and I guess, you know, tell people about that race if they don't know about it. And 
there was you know, the fact that I feel like there's other than maybe the Prefontaine race where he was running 807, probably with a little bit more company. I feel like you didn't have much company at all that day at, at Franklin at Franklin Field. No, I mean, for the first mile, I think uh, Mike O'Connor, who ran, uh, he was also from from Long Island, uh, St. John the Baptist High School, I think. He was uh, with me for about a mile, I think, maybe a little bit less. You know, I think I came through the mile around 4.23 or something. Um, and then people from there started to uh, started trail off. But, um, yeah, I mean, my last 400, I think, was like 58 seconds, which was, was you know. And you probably won by, I would say, 10 seconds or so? Uh, yeah, 821 was second place. Either 820 or 821. So I was even talking to one of our old coaches, Matt Centrowitz Sr., who's been a guest on this program. And just this past weekend, and he was talking about that race. And I didn't know you yet because I was you know, still in grade school. But Matt Centrowitz Sr. talks about how he just saw this kid running and the fact that he ran a sub-60 quarter when there was really, I mean, other than breaking the record, which is probably, was that, was that, were you keen on breaking the yeah, record? Yeah, I actually was. That was, uh, you know, there's two goals I had. One was breaking that record, and the other was breaking four in the mile my senior year. Okay, which would have, would have broke Matt Centrowitz Sr.'s. Yeah, it would have broken his high school record, record, which yeah. he still holds four of two. He so. does. He still has it, which is which is amazing, especially with these new spikes and everything. Oh yeah, fast know. tracks. Yeah, fast tracks. But but I really wanted to break four. Um, that didn't happen. I ended up getting mono right after uh, you know that three thousand. I guess it was just you know my my resistance or it was down a bit, probably right. just from training and racing hard, and and I caught it, and that was pretty much the end of my season. It was the end of my season. So. Right, but it's still a very good season. I know. Um, looking at some of the research. Again, beating Steve Prefontaine's record. And then you held that record for 18 years until someone named Galen Rupp broke yeah, it. Yeah, Galen Rupp broke so it. So when yep. you think about a pretty good company between uh, Galen Rupp, Prefontaine, Troutman. Yeah. So then obviously you had a very good high school career. Can you tell us a little bit about your recruiting process? Did you always want to go to Georgetown where you ended up? Yes and no. I, I visited, actually visited Georgetown my junior year. On uh, we, had, we had a race down at William & Mary. Okay. Um, and we drove down, and on the way back, my dad drove me back, and we stopped at Georgetown for a quick visit, unofficial visit. Right. Um, and I really liked it there. I liked gags. You know, I hung out with Miles Irish and, and Mike Starr a little bit, and they were big heroes. My, you know, when I was a freshman in New York, they you know, both they both from New York kids, right? Yeah, and they were like the seniors that were like, right. you know, Mike Starr was that was the great mile, and Miles ran that the. Uh, I don't know if he had a national record in the thousand indoors, but he ran like 223, 224, which right. at that time was was very, very fast. It was definitely the state record. It okay. might not have been a national record. But. So they were down there, so that was attractive to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like they were kind of like my heroes when I was a freshman, and that that was another big attraction for me to go to Georgetown. The coach there, which was both you know, coached me post-collegially and coached you in college, Probably had a big, big, it was a, probably a big factor in you going there as well, right? Yeah, yeah. I really like Gags. You know, he has so much energy and, and such a motivational person. Well, 1961 rolled out around and we didn't have football, and they asked me to take over track and field and start a cross country team. 55 years later, I'm sitting here being interviewed as a track coach. 25. But I wasn't afraid or frightened of calling coaches up, reading books, and so forth and learning how to coach, and learning how to coach strength, and learning how to coach speed. And all through my career, I'm still learning. But you gotta be aware mentally what you're doing with these athletes, and how they feel, and you talk to them. But also the school, it's a great school. Right. Like, I really like DC. And it was really between Georgetown and Wisconsin at that time. Wisconsin had just uh, broken, or excuse me, just won the, uh, the NCAA cross country title. Right. And Scott Fry, who actually was going after that Prefontaine record the year before, I think he ran 808 and just missed her 809. Right. Um, went there, and that was, you know, oh, you know, Wisconsin's got this great program. Maybe I'll go there. But in the back of my mind, I always kind of knew I was going to go to Georgetown. And again, I ran with Gags down when I graduated St. John's, went down to the Reebok Enclave, which we'll get into a little bit about post-collegiate running and how there's not a ton of options, but right. you're offering one of the options now here with Empire Track Club, which we'll get to. Empire Elite. Empire Elite, that's right. <laughs> so there's another coach that I think came into your life when you were in college, maybe even your freshman year, was Matt Centrowitz Sr., which we talked about a little bit. He has the New York State record still. His yep. son, obviously, Matt Jr., obviously won the, the uh, gold medal in, in Rio, which I think, were you there? I wasn't there, uh, no, your, your no. Yeah, Tom, Tommy, Tommy you know, Hill, he was, was in there. the stands. But I did pick Matt for the win in that, by okay. the way. Yeah. <laughs> so I think freshman year, you got introduced to Matt Centrowitz. That's the first time you met him? Might have been freshman year, but but he uh, he was in New York or New Jersey at the time. And then he, Gags, 
he moved down to, I think, Maryland. Maybe it was between my sophomore and junior okay. year. And he kind of came down and helped out Gags with some of the distance guys. Because Gags was more of an 800-meter, 1,500-meter guy. And they were thinking about Gags wanted to move me up to the 5,000. So the perfect person to do it was someone who had the national record at one point. Matt right. had run 13-13, I think, or 13-12 and had the national record for a little bit. I think Alberto might have broken it. Alberto broke it like nine days later. Yeah, something like that. And it was more like a, and I feel like Matt's record was in a, an official race where it seemed like Alberto's race was more like a setup race. Yeah, it might have been. It and might Matt have had been. it for nine days, but then Alberto yeah. had it for like nine years. Yeah, 13, yeah, 11. it's kind of wild. I guess you know, out in Oregon, they, you know, they set up a lot of races out there, and, and the best runners in the in the country were always out at Oregon in the seventies and, right. and early eighties, and and. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the place where, where so most of the national I would say Gags is probably the, the best motivator I know as far as track and field coaches. And I feel like, oddly enough, Matt Sedgwick Sr. Uh, is very intuitive. Extremely. I feel like he would, I remember one time when I was struggling with my running, he was the one guy that was like, stop running, son. Yeah. Whereas like, like Gags <laughs> oftentimes would be like, all right, do you have to work out or maybe yeah. sit every other one out or maybe take yeah. one day off and come back. Sedgwick's really just had a, the pulse of more the intuition of, mm -hmm. all right, you should run more, you should run less. And I feel like the combination of the motivator and gags and the, you know, obviously yeah. Sedgwick's had the, the credentials as well, running 402 in high school and run, run 13, right. 12. But I think the best of both worlds as far as coaching probably helped mold you as an athlete and then probably as a coach today, right? Oh, definitely, definitely. Matt, Matt, as you said, is very intuitive. He knows how to get inside your head and, and really kind of actually knows what you're thinking and what you're going through since he's been there. It was kind of uncanny the way he knew like what exactly what I was thinking, which right. was amazing for a coach. I wish I could do that, but but uh... a lot of people don't know Gags played football for Richmond and did a little bit of I think pro semi football in, in Canada. Yeah, uh, right. But yeah. he was a quarterback. Yeah, I remember in DC he would still throw football. We our track was uh, same place as the as it went around the football field. Right. Once in a while I'd have a football and and the guy could still throw like a bullet, man. Right. You know, and I guess he, back then he was like forty years old. So it was, right, he doesn't. Yeah, he doesn't strike me <laughs> as the quarterback type. What makes running different than other sports? I think it's really an individual, a lot of individual in running. He was the motivator. He would have kids just running through brick walls for him. Yeah. But I think just the combination of Centrowitz, knowing that the, the, the A, the, being an Olympian himself, uh, he mm -hmm. won four national titles in the, in the 5,000. 1992 comes around, you're running the Olympic trials. You, you graduated from Georgetown or you're you still at yeah, Georgetown? Yeah, no, I graduated in 91. Okay. And, uh, you know, I kind of hung around uh, I don't think the Enclave had started until 92 or 3, but, you know, I was staying stayed there. I was going to stay with Gags. We had, a, we had a great bunch of core people there, like Peter Sherry, who was, I think, second in the 10,000 in the NCAAs. And then we had Steve Holman, who ended up running 331 for the 1500, and Rich Kana, who has two bronze medals in the world championships. Right. I mean, we were all within two years of each other. Um, so you all graduated, stuck around for the next yeah, Olympic cycle. Yeah, yeah, and we're there. And then there were some other people that were lived in town or in the neighboring suburbs, like Bill Burke was from Northern Virginia, right? Who ran for Princeton. Bob Lesko, who ran for Yale, was in lived in George. Actually, he's from Georgetown. Really? And uh, yeah, a few other guys. And uh, you know, it just kind of started that little group there. And. It was just great to have people to train with, you know? Yeah, because even from my experience, you know, a couple years later, you graduate, go from the best system in the world of the NCAA, where you have, like, you know, everything taken care of for you, travel's taken care of you. If you, go to, if you get into the NCAAs or Olympic trials, you get that, that's paid for, and you have, you know, strength and conditioning, you have uh, training staff, then you graduate, and there's really not a lot. And even today, there's maybe a couple more, but you really have not a lot of options if you want to continue running. I feel like we go from the best system in the world with NCAAs. A lot of foreign athletes come over here yeah. to run in college, and then you graduate, and there's not a huge support system for track and field. Uh, my college coach, Jim Hurt, used to say, if you were the, the 10th best shortstop, you'd be doing pretty well, pretty yeah. well you know, yeah. playing for whatever, the New York Yankees or whatever, Derek Jeter. But if you're the 10th best in the country in the 800 meters or 5,000, I remember when I went down to D.C., I was making 300 bucks a month, which I used to pay my rent. And you had to get a job and all that stuff. So yeah. I feel like your group, uh, again, there was a group in the 70s with, with uh, out in Oregon, and you graduate, you still have a lot of running uh, in your system, ideally. Um, so explain, like, as you graduated and transitioned to a post-collegiate athlete, I think you had a deal or a relationship with Adidas. Yeah. First, I graduated in 1991, and I actually ran for the New York AC oh, there you go. for one race, which was the Outdoor National Championships. And 
I think that may have been the only time New York AC won the meet. Their team scored it then. I don't okay. think they do that they anymore. They used to, yeah, for sure. And, and we won, and uh, that was my one race there. So I won the, I won the 5,000. Uh, then it was called the TAC, the Athletics right. Congress meet. And I won the five, and I think Pete Cherry was uh, like six, maybe. And this and is 91, right? This is 91, yeah. I said 92 rolls around, it's the Olympic year. I think yeah. track and field becomes important every four years, unfortunately, with the Olympic cycle. That's the same for wrestling and right. gymnastics and swimming. But obviously, it's a big deal when 1992, Barcelona Olympics, you know, obviously you and your, your fellow training partners were obviously eyeing that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, luckily, after that meet, uh, the, the national meet, Adidas, uh, you know, gave me a contract to sign, which was not much. I think it was like six or seven thousand dollars right. for the year. And I kind of figured out, budgeted my life so I could kind of get by on that and not have to work. Um, I ran a couple of road races that prize money here. Yeah, and there. yeah. I made like eight thousand dollars in one race, which was really almost you know it was very helpful. Right, got me through the year. Yeah. So. Tell us about the Olympic trials. They were in New Orleans, which is, you know, known for not uh, the most ideal running weather, like with Eugene, Oregon. So yeah. it's hot and humid. It was horrible. <laughs> so, uh, I remember a story that, you know, in the trials, you, you were having a, a day that maybe, you know, wasn't going as well. And you had to kind of put your head down and, and get into the finals and then the finals itself. But tell us about your Olympic trials experience and, and, and making your, your the U.S. team that year. Yeah. I mean, the first round of the semis, um, you know, mentally, it's sometimes it's tough to get as up for the rounds, and you don't expect it to to be in as much fatigue as you're going to be. And yeah, your you're pain the reigning champ, right? You're coming yeah, back. Yeah, the pain expectation and what you know, they don't they're not uh, you know really in line a lot of times. So you know, we were only running 1350 something pace, but it was hot and humid, and I wasn't feeling great. So right. I'm like, geez, you know, <laughs> I gotta you know middle of the race i'm like this is this is a lot tougher than i thought it was going to be i ended up you know pulling it together and, and winning the the semifinal heat and uh you know making it to the finals uh, but also at that time my foot was really starting to bug me right so i was having some problems there um the day actually in between the semis and the finals um i could barely run right you know i was like hobbling around i was like i had both plantar fasciitis and helix rigidus, which is uh, basically the, the cartilage in my first metatarsal was, uh, you know, disintegrated and I was, had bone on bone. And this was a new injury for you or you had it previously? Um, I had had it. I, I didn't know what it was at that time. I right. just thought, you know, My everyone hurts. just is hurt. You know, that's normal. Right. Things right. hurt. Rub um, some dirt on it, right? Yeah. So I just, you know, thought, day of the finals, I just took a bunch of Advil and, and got through it. And, and I felt a lot better in the finals. But... Oh. You know, we only ran 1340, and it was it, it felt a lot harder than that. Right, and you got kicked Bob Kennedy, right? Yeah, and I think John Bob was second. He was like 1341 something, and Johnny Gregoric's dad, John Gregoric, was right. third. Right. Just at the end, he nipped. Uh, I don't know who it was. He nipped. Another but... Long Island, New York guy, St. Anthony's High School. I yeah, St. Anthony's. Yep. yep. My, my rival. Yep. He just had his um, he just had his mile record broken. Oh. By by uh, his Georgetown mile record broken okay. by another St. Anthony's. Oh really? Runner, yeah. Comes full circle. Yeah. You made the U.S. team in '92, mm -hmm. Barcelona. That had to be an experience, a dream team, right? Yeah, it was fantastic. You know, I'm there with uh, El Magico, <laughs> and uh, you know Michael Jordan. And the, and the great part about it was that uh, our basketball trainer, Lori Michael, was also the Olympic trainer of, okay. for the basketball team. So okay. I was I'd be in the training room with my with my hurt foot. And uh, I'd meet all the guys, you know. And, and Ewing was at Georgetown. And right? Ewing was it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that'd be real. I mean, again, you probably had to, well, you're trying to enjoy the experience of the opening ceremonies or even just the, being on an Olympian and what goes. We, we're seeing that now at the, the Winter Olympics. Yeah. Um, and so, but in the back of your head, you're not 100%. So that, no, has, that had to no, be tough was, to kind of I manage. Was, yeah, I wasn't really running much at all at that point. Um, you know, the foot had gotten a lot worse. And, uh, you know, I was kind of hobbling around. And, and the good thing was that, you know, by going to the Olympics, I wasn't taking any one spot because there was only three people that actually had the time. Right. Unfortunately, Johnny Gregor John Gregoric, who was in third, did not have the standards. So Ruben Reyna, who was, I think, like seventh, when? got to go. Right. Which I'm saying unfortunate for John Gregoric, right. not for Ruben. Right. But, um, so like even you going there being injured not 100 percent it, it was it didn't it was like it, it wasn't taking. I wasn't taking a slot right. you know and and that was that was that was a, not a decision I wanted to make if I was taking a slot up. right right so that'd been a tough one so 
which just kind of transitions into like transitions into the uh, second chapter. Now I know you have a couple more years of professional running. I know you're dealing with the injury. Uh, I know that Barcelona didn't go as well as you would have liked. Uh, again, in injury. Um, yeah. So the next four years, you basically ran through to the to '96, or were you? Well, yeah, I had a contract with uh, Adidas through '96. I mean, I ran sporadically. I had two surgeries during right. in between '92 and '96, um, and neither of them really worked. I had what's called a chylectomy, okay, and uh, what's called a Mulberg procedure. Which I won't get to exactly, but they didn't work. Right. And so I, I tried to run, and, and it just it, it wasn't it wasn't going well at all. I did manage to make world cross country and run world cross country. Uh, I think in '94, but that was that was probably the toughest race I ever ran. Like just trying to get there in those trials. Right. You know. And by the middle or the beginning of '96, I knew I was done. Right. You know, I, I qualified by the skin of my teeth to make the trials in '96, right. but I didn't go because right. there was just no way I was going right. to, you know, pull it together. So this brings us into like part two that I want to talk about a little bit before we get to part three, which kind of brings us full circle. So mm -hmm. you joined Wall Street right away, or you... well, I worked at a, a consulting firm uh, in Arlington, Virginia, called Cambridge Associates for about a year and a half. Um, that was, I think, I started there in '96. Well, in the 96 to the middle of 97. But and you're running at all at this point? No, 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 right. not running at all. Um, but I was, I was extra, I was doing other things and I was still young, so I wasn't gaining any weight yet. Right. But then when I moved up to New York, I want, I really want to come back to New York and, and get involved in, in, in something else other than running. Cause right. of, you know, my identity was all running right. until then. And it was just tough cause I couldn't do it. So I had to find something else to, to like kind of have my identity. Right. So I just threw myself into, into work. And, uh, you know, I started working on Wall Street and not running at all. Right. You know, just kind of like not even looking at results, like just totally like just shutting it out for about. And then obviously, you know, yeah, because it's like all your life you're running. That's who you're known for. That's your yeah, identity. Yeah. You're good at it. So there's the whole confidence thing. And, I, you know, yeah. and then you have to switch gears. I went through this a little bit. I made the trials in 96 for the right, 100 right. meters. And that was great. And then I went to run with Gags and Centro and right. some of the athletes, you know, some of your teammates with uh, Holman and Kana yeah. and Pete Cherry and Ray, Ray Pugsley and those guys, Scott Anderson. Scott and Slicko. And then, um, <laughs> but then, yeah, a couple years later, like, I don't make the trials in 2000, which I think we met. I was driving the vans at the trials because... Oh, that was in Sacramento, right? And you were jumping in the pool, not running. That's uh, right. We, I was that's hanging out I with Gags. I think we officially buddies. met. Yeah, that's was with Gags. With, with our group. And yeah. I was like, at the tail end of it, you had taken, you'd already kind of left. Yeah. But I knew the name from my New York connections and just being coached yeah. by the same coaches that were coached, that coached you. And then it was like, this was 2000. Then it took me a couple of years to do different things. And then it must have been, I don't know, 2010. So fast forward 10 years. I'm mm. working, I think probably at New York Roadrunners. I started, Gags moved back yeah, to, 2000. Gags moved back to uh, Rye, yeah. or back to New York. He's living in Rye, New York. He's coaching some people. You started going, tell me about that experience, because that's where we officially started actually running together, uh, very casually and not with a focus on being competitive. It was more just like being healthy and then having gags yell at us once in a while. Yeah. Nostalgia yeah. a little bit. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't remember exactly when I started. It, it probably was 2010, but he was uh, coaching Aaron Donahue, mm -hmm. who is from uh, New Jer Southern New Jersey. And I, I don't... I guess she'd moved back into the area or up more uh, up towards New York, I guess. And uh, Tom Nohilly was working out a little bit. So I just went up there one day and, and uh, you know, had some running shoes with me. And he's like, yeah, why don't you get on the track and do some 400? So I did, I think, four or five in like 90 seconds. How much are you weighing at this point? I just know. Well, I... you know, I, I think that might, you know, some of these weight stories get a little exaggerated. Right. But I, 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 was, I was over 200 pounds. I wasn't 210, which the rumors are like 210, 215, but no. That was about 200. Um, and you're, just, and you're, what was your fighting weight back when you were making the team in 92? I was 137. Okay. You know, and uh, I, I was leading a terrible lifestyle as far as health right. goes. You know, I was, you know. So this brings us to the end of part two, which again was not no running at all. And you're in Wall Street. You're not following results. You really kind of like mm -hmm. shifted gears and you wanted almost nothing to do with running. Right. And then... Inertia, gags, you know, perfect storm of gags being back in in town. You yeah. kind of talking to Tommy. Uh, that's kind of with me. I basically was like, I was fit enough, still running, but not really seriously. And I was like, oh, gags is back. And you think with Monday nights we drive up and yeah. And I don't, how did that start? I don't really even I don't know. know. I, I was working on New York Roadrunners at the time. That's why I know that it was basically 2010, 2011, and it was just fun to go up there with gags and him like time us. 
Yeah. And do repeat 400s. And, you know, his big joke was he'd be looking at his watch yeah. and he'd be like, Tuesday, Wednesday, yeah. Thursday, because we were so slow. Dude, do you remember um, Joey Cheeks? I do. The, the speed skater. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the gold medal speed skater was working out with us, man. So, yeah, we had a kind of a yeah, yeah. random group. Leslie Higgins yeah. was up there. Yeah. We were just kind yeah. of like, yeah, I, Leslie Higgins. I was just and... going there for, I missed the once a week track sessions. I missed Gags barking at us. Yeah. I remember some of his like coin phrases were, he would call you a BI, which is a short for a bad investment. Yeah. I remember yeah. him saying, like, you know, hey, Hunter Camp, you, you know, you, at least, at least uh, Troutman was a, was a has been. You were, yeah. never were. <laughs> yeah. He's like, all American, you're not even going to make all provolone tea. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's how we connected. And then it was really kind of, again, casual, more nostalgic, yeah. kind of fun, getting a little fitter. You're obviously, your yeah. corners went from 90s to 80s and yeah, maybe 70s. Yeah, I was 70s, trying to lose weight more than anything. Weight. You know, just and not... then, you know, I think that's when Gags' group kind of, I don't know, it's like, because Gags went from Georgetown to f the farm team out with Vinland Anna, the Stanford kind of yeah. post-collegiate team. Then he went to Oregon, Oregon, Oregon Track Club. And now he's back on the East Coast, kind of figuring things out, coaching Aaron Donahue and some other athletes. Yeah, yeah. And kind of put together the New Jersey, New York Track Club. You and I are has beens or never were, were. Yeah. And we just kind of liked being up there, just like getting yeah, barked at a little bit. Yeah, it was fun. And we had a lot. I mean, we had, you know, you know, Leslie, me, you, and then and then there was Lauren. Um, Joey Cheeks. Joey Cheeks. And uh, I actually heard he was he was um, announcing uh, the uh, Olympic trials in, okay. uh, in, in short track, which was kind of funny. I was like, oh, Joey Cheeks. But uh, it was just fun going up there and, and, and getting a workout in and, and doing something other than just working. And, and, and I was starting to like trying to change my lifestyle a little bit, right. not eating like crap. And, and, and uh, I remember just like, I think I kind of stopped going up the rye. I got busy with life. And then you, were st you stuck with it. And this kind of brings us to part three where you're kind of getting in shape again, just for fun, just more for like lifestyle stuff, mm -hmm. not no competition on your radar. I think you were running twice a week you had your 14 mile long run at van Cortland park and then you did the monday or tuesday workout with me and gags i feel like and then yeah. the rest you were cross training i was, -training. I was on the, your foot, uh, right? the arc trainer yeah right yeah i'd get up in the morning uh at like quarter to five and you're I'd... still working full time right yeah yeah i'd get in there because i was at work at seven o'clock so i had to be done with my workout by like 6 30 um you know so i was on the arc trainer uh for a half hour to an hour every morning and then i'd also go on it after work for an hour. Okay. So it so was not, just kind of bothering your foot, but getting the cardio. No, in. Yeah. Yeah. So I was losing weight. I was, you know, getting a bit of uh, my aerobic system going, you know, with the workouts and that. And, uh, you know, and, and the track workouts were starting to uh, starting to come down. Like you're saying, like from nineties to eighties to 78s. Uh, I think we were running like seventies, you know, right. by the end of it, 68s even. Still working full time and you're, and you're, and you're work, you're working out right, gags once, right. once a week in the evening, we go up there, it'd be dark. Up yeah, in Rye, yeah, that Rye was, track, and yeah. oh remember, yeah, that's right. I remember driving dark, back. On, what was the road we, we, we always kill ourselves getting onto? The the, the this, Mushalu Parkway. Mushalu Parkway. <laughs> we always like I don't know how you get on that parkway. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Tell us about how you got into coaching and then running. Obviously, so you ran. You were more as an athlete now, or a master's athlete, if you will, yeah. than coaching. I know you started doing some stuff at NYU, and you're still well, there now. But what was the kind of the trajectory or the the, the, the order of events of us training together, doing seventy second quarters? to uh you doing some coaching and then more more like kind of elite, elite running again yeah well i think i started um actually going with gags to practices of, of nja and y down and in new jersey right down Rutgers? in new jersey yeah and i was starting to work out with the women once in a while not like you know it was like days that were holidays like i didn't have to go into work or if they had to work out on a saturday i'd go down um and then you know as i got better once in a while, I'd run it. I'd jump in with the guys and do like every other rep or, or something like it was just starting to it was starting to click. Right. Um, but when it really, you know, really got got going was when um, it was 2014. I was at the last firm I was at, um, and they basically shut down our whole our whole desk, our whole department, and so I wasn't working. Was able to go to practice with them and and really you know, put 100% in, into, into running for a while. And you weren't coaching yet, right? You were kind of... No, old. no, I wasn't coaching uh, yet. But um, Gags brought me on the next year, I think in 2015, maybe, or 16. No, 15, as, as, a, as just a assistant coach. Right. But at the same time, um, uh, uh, Will Boylan Pett right. uh, left NYU. Okay. Um, he was the head coach, and Arison Hertalt, which was the assistant coach, moved to the temporary head coaching position. They needed someone else to come in. Right. 
Um, so, you know, he reached out and I said, yeah, sure. You know, I'm not working. I'll do that part time and right. do this part time. And and uh, it just kind of went from there. So you now know? you're coaching at the college ranks. And then you're also getting a little bit fitter, you know, and you're enjoying that process, mm -hmm. being around Gags, assistant coach yep. for the, yep. the elite program there yep. in New Jersey, New York Track Club. But like what got you to like sign up for not just a 5K road race, but like a, a, a mile on the track? Yeah, the first the first race that I saw a glimmer of hope <laughs> was Fifth Avenue Mile, um, where I ran four, maybe 426. And how I old are you? What, yeah, I don't remember. Probably what like early 40s. Yeah. Oh, I was in my 40s. Yeah, I don't. It was early 40s. Uh, and then I, ran, I was running road miles. Then I ran a Ridgewood road mile, which I which I got second in. Right. Um, you know, I think I was probably forty two then. And you're just like, oh, this is fun to compete again. Yeah, yeah. And so I just kept, you know, I kept training. I kept seeing my times get better and better um, in, in practice. So I decided to sign up for some track races. Now what's Gags thinking at this point? Is he like, yeah, you, should, you know, because yeah, was... he's like, yeah, get out there and run, right. you know. So I was like, yeah, all right. So I. I started running some of the uh, those those uh, Tuesday or Thursday night the uh, meets at the at the Armory. Uh, the first one I ran, I tripled. I ran the six hundred, the thousand, and the thirty two hundred or something, just or three thousand. Just yeah. as a hard workout, pretty much. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know why I decided to triple, but I figured, you know, why not? And I actually got sick after that, but for like a week. But that was my first real track, my first real track races, and I keep going. And with the following year. Um, you know, things started to really, really start going. I, you know, I, I uh, ran some uh, college meets. I think I ran, there was a meet that, that Columbia might have put on or either NYU or Columbia put on in the armory. And I ran that and I think I ran like 422 or 423. And then I was like, whoa, man, I, you know, at this point the, the record was 418. Right. For, for 45 uh, to 49, yeah. So, you know, maybe I can get that. It's not right. too far Couple off. Couple seconds. So I started training and uh, I was running races. And I think the week before I really wanted to go after it, Brad Barton went out and he broke the record. <laughs> right. Yeah. And he ran 417. Actually, I'm sorry. The record was like 420 something at that point. And he ran. He ran 417 or 418. And he had the new record. So right. then I was like, oh, you know, I thought I could break the first record, but now I got to right. run faster than 418. Like, I don't know if I can do that. Right. Or 417, I think it was. Um, I remember you going up to Boston and running a Masters, actually, like an elite Masters race. It was, it yes, 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 yes. Oh, yeah, I did. I ran one earlier um, that I kind of skipped over with Tom Nohilly. He crushed me that day. Oh, really? This was back maybe in 2012 or 2012, 2011. Um, I ran 430 something, and he, I think he ran 420 something. Right. But that was, uh, we were both in our, in our earlier 40s at that point. And I wasn't as fit, uh, you know, as I was. You know, I was still pretty far behind in my fitness, uh, you know, stage stage wise. Right. Um, so, yeah, that was my first. Uh, that was one of my first track races. I kind of forgot about that one. And I saw you run in Boston, where you won. You didn't have a lot of competition. You won by a couple seconds. Yeah. Well, then, okay. Then the next time I ran in Boston, I got second in that Masters race okay. to a guy that turned forty that day. Oh, really? That day was his birthday, and he beat me. Like, and I was like, oh God. You know, and that was the year after that that things really started to, to get going. The right. year after that, um, you know, I was getting better and better shape. Brad Barton had already set the record. So now the bar was a lot higher. Uh, so I had to, uh, you know, I, am I going to break 418, 417? You know, I wasn't sure, but I was, but I was training, training to do it. So the first race I had was a race in the armory, which was a college race. I ran like 422. Um, then the next race was the race up in Boston that, that you talk about. And I won that. I ran, I just missed the record. Like 419 I, or something? Yeah, maybe? something like that. I set the, I set the meet record there, but, but the uh, national or the world age group record, I, I just missed it. Um, and, you know, I was like, man, I, I pretty much thought I gave everything I had at right. Reggie Lewis. But then I go to BU, which I, you know, I had no idea how fast BU was. I right. mean, it's like, <laughs> go to BU and it's like, you know, bouncing right. my way around the track. It's, it was the effort that I put forth week before, two weeks before, you was, know, it seemed like it was much less effort to run 412 and right. break the record. Like right. I was like, wow, <laughs> this is nuts. And then when you run that day, that was 412. And that's when I set the record. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. You so know? now obviously you, again, you're in high school, you're trying to win this, the, fe the fed meet, or you wouldn't try to break Prefontaine's 805 or 807. Um, and then obviously you have Olympic trials. 
here you are, 46 years old, trying to break another record. And there's obviously a lot of similarities. You got to put the work in. You got to do the long yeah. runs. You got to do the track work. You're obviously a lot smarter because you're not probably doing the volume that you, you were, your your younger body was doing. Same. I wasn't that smart, man. Summer coaches, <laughs> same, same coach, right? Kind of again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, were you just as nervous, just as excited, or is it kind of like uh, is it on par? No, nah, I wasn't right. nervous at all. Just I was like, having fun. Like right. it didn't matter. Like you know, before it was important. Like if I beat this guy or beat that guy, now it's just I'm just running for myself. You right. know, I just want to get clock. a certain time. Like if this right. guy beats me, I don't care. Right. You know, I'm just doing, seeing what I can do. You know, and and that's why there's no nerves. It's everybody's right. like hanging out, all the massive guys like hanging bonus, out. Right? And yeah, and it, it was just a lot of fun. It's it's definitely more fun. Right. Because there's less pressure, but right. It's the point that you're probably running way faster than probably some of them, right? Mm -hmm. of NYU. Oh well, yeah, yeah. Well. Or, you know, you're mixing it up where, you know, yeah. you're not just the yeah, old yeah. coach Yeah, I just yelling. started NYU. It was, it was a lot of fun coaching those guys because it's, it's a different level, obviously. Um, but all these kids really want to run. You know, getting no money, you're paying 70 something thousand dollars for school and, and studying and, and, right. and you're still putting time in to run and be competitive. You know, it's, it's you really got to love the sport to do that. And then do you love coaching? I mean, I do. I really right. do. I never thought I would be a good coach when I was younger. And I don't know if I am at this point either, but I think I'm getting better at it. Right. You know, I don't have a lot of the skills that that Matt Century Senior has or the Gags has, but right. I think I have my own set of skills that, right. that, you, that you pull can from help. like yeah. their toolboxes where it makes yeah. sense. Yeah. You know how to push buttons now better. Yeah, uh, I just probably, I mean, I I feel like I you know again I had a running career and then I kind of graduated. Now my work stuff is running related or it's event based with health and wellness. So right. I feel like I've kind of made my passion my career to some degree. But not, I mean, I coached college for a couple of years, and that's a, that's a grind where you're three seasons, right. you're recruiting, um, you know, yeah. you have to kind of love that as well. Right, um, right now I'm only coaching three athletes, so okay. it's not too tough. So you can really focus. Yeah, but I can focus on the three guys, so, which I mean, is great. I, I look you know? back at running, and like it's, I'm still doing it in a different way, and I, I, I love it for different reasons. And I feel like if you didn't have this second or this 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 second running career of coaching and, and, and actually being an elite athlete, world-class athlete of your age group, I feel like based on my own experience of like running being really my, my, my band, everything in my life. And then it went, didn't go as well. It didn't end away. Like you obviously didn't yeah. want to be injured at the Olympics. I obviously didn't make a team, wanted to make a team. I wanted to run faster. So our running careers ended. Right. And now you probably look back at running. I think it's probably better that you had this, A, you're in it as a coach now, but also you had this really positive experience as being an athlete again. And yeah. that middle couple of years where you're, you know, weren't running at all and you needed a break, um, I, I think you're probably grateful that you had this, this second chance at it because you know, it look, it's easy to look back and say, like, oh, those are the years when I used to be the runner and now I'm the, the stockbroker or something yeah, else. Yeah, but yeah. now you're, I feel like you were always a runner. You were just choosing not to run. Right. I guess that's true. I mean, I'm glad I had to. I mean, I'm, I'm happy now. I mean, life's just going to unfold how it does. Right. And, and you can't really look back and have any regrets. But, but I think, you know, I definitely feel like I had some kind of redemption, you know. You know, it didn't end well. Running, you know, back in 99, whenever it ended, 94, you know, I consider it 92 was the end, but, right. but I kept trying to go. But, but you know, it was a tough breakup with running, you right. know? No, it was absolutely. like, you know, it's like one of those where you just got to shut the door and not look, not look, right. not look behind the door anymore. And then that's what I did. But now I can look back on everything. Right. And, and, and I'm happy with it. And, and, uh, you know, it's it's great to be back in the sport, and it's great to be giving back now. Right. You know, to be coaching these athletes. I mean, we have some really so, great athletes on the club now. Uh, fast forward to today, tell us about Empire. Well, Empire League came about um, as you know, we were with New Jersey New York Track Club. Gags was the head coach. Tom Nohilly and myself were assistant coaches. Uh, we were sponsored by Hoka and Hoka Oneone, and after. Uh, our contract went through 2020, and then there was an the option for them to extend us right. uh, through 24. The Olympic trials, obviously, were, were postponed. Um, and we thought, you know, our, our contract was going to go to the end of December. Which, there was only six months until the, the postponed trials. So we thought right. maybe they'd give us a little extension. A little extension. But, but Pandemic, no, you know. they gave us nothing. Right. You know, and they just they kicked us to the curb. So right. we were a bit... Uh, you know, that motivated us a bit to, to start our own club and, and uh, you know, really see what we could do. And, and it's it's turned out well, really well. We have some great athletes that, that are doing some really big things these days. Colby Alexander. 352 uh, he just ran a couple weeks ago, 352, right? 352, I think. Not sponsored, you know, right? Dude, he's got nothing. I mean, we give him a little bit of money. You know, that's the state of the sport right now. Right. I mean, I think he'll have something soon, you right. know, in negotiations right now. But 
But, you know, I think that's the one one thing about our club is, is we give some of these guys a chance that, that don't get sponsored. And, right. and we can help out with, you know, we help out with travel. or we, Coaching. Coaching. You know, we help do what we can. Some people get a little bit of a stipend, some medical stuff. And, you know, we have a couple of, uh, you know, generous donors that have helped us out. Right. And so how many athletes are on your roster currently? Right all, now we have all, 20. But, okay. Um, you know, some of them, uh, you know, we have a, a group that's out in Flagstaff right now. Right. Um, and then the other group uh, is here in New York. And, and we kind of go back and forth. Tommy was out in Flagstaff for a few weeks uh, last month. I'm probably going to go out next month for a little bit. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a good situation because, you know, these guys, uh, it's good to get into the altitude. Flagstaff is 7,000 right. feet. And it's a whole, I mean, it's just a whole community of runners out there. And it's a very good vibe. You know, everyone gets together on Sunday runs and go to the track in Sedona, which is at 4,000 feet. Right. You know, it's 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 actually a, a Long Island. Uh, the guy who coaches uh, the high school that we go to is an ex Long Island coach. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, New York roots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's always excited when we come down. Right. It, it's going well. It's just the problem is, you know, the money we have is going to run out. Right. And, and we really need to get some kind of corporate sponsorship. Right. Yeah. You know, track and field again. It's it's popular every four years of the Olympic cycle, but athletes are training all year, all those four years, you know? So yeah. And I think post-collegially, there's obviously an indoor circuit, which, you know, I call these running 352. You know, typically, for, for those who might not know, high school and college is pretty e equal between cross-country, indoors, and outdoors, especially on the Northeast, mm -hmm. East Coast. Some of the West, like Arizona, don't have much of an indoor nah. season. So, but when you graduate, it's really all about outdoors, to, to, you know, because that's the Olympic cycle. I know there's actually yeah. a campaign to get cross country into the Winter Olympics, yeah, which would be yeah, phenomenal. Yeah. Kyle Merber, man. Yeah, good stuff. <laughs> it's still uh, 12 months out of the year you're training, even exactly. if just outdoors. Yep. And then every, yep. unfortunately, every four years is when shoe companies maybe perk up. And then there's even a cycle where we were at Reebok, but then this company like ups the ante and this, this yeah. the funding is pulled here. And yep. you kind of just have to kind of follow the cash a little bit and the support. So. Uh, how can we, uh, those that are at home in the audience, or you tuning in, a follow um, Empire uh, Elite Track Club? Well, first of all, you can follow us on uh, follow us on uh, Instagram at EmpireEliteTrack.club uh, on Instagram, and also that's the same as our website. Okay. And we have a uh, donation button. If you when you go on to EmpireEliteTrack.club, scroll down to the bottom. There's a donation button, uh, and you can donate and. and you know, we're a 501c3, so your do donations are tax deductible. And, you know, it's it's something we really need to survive until we get some sort of a, a sponsorship, which right now it's not looking like anything is going to happen soon. So right. some of our athletes are individually sponsored right. uh, and getting that and, and getting sponsored, but it's great for them. But last week in Boston, we had Chiano Fiore, who's another Long Island kid, ran right. 219 in 1,000. Right. Guy Ben Allen, uh, Division Two guy that just started with us, ran 220. Jeremy Hernandez okay. uh, ran 241, and Luciano and Ben are going out to nationals out in Washington next weekend. Okay. Also, Eric Holt uh, qualified in the mile, or 1500 in Colby Alexander. So we have four athletes going to the indoor nationals in Spokane uh, next week. Great, and that's the main thing. It's like you graduate college, because we talked about it earlier, going from a pretty nice situation being in college. Yeah, obviously, D D1 a little bit better than D2 and D3 as far as support. Right. But then, like, you're 22 years old, 21 years old, and then all of a sudden you're on your own. And especially in middle distance, definitely endurance, uh, marathon, 5K, 10Ks, you're not peaking to your late 20s. And so how do you yeah. go from 22 to 28 where the opportunity costs where you might be giving up a career or putting on a pause because you want to you know, pursue an Olympic dream? And I think that's something where, you know, the sprinters, I don't, I'm not saying they have it easier, but they, they peak probably in their early 20s. So... Maybe they, they graduate at 22, and next thing you know, they're, they're the Olympic cycles are you know, one, two, three, four years away. It's a little bit easier to stay in the game, but it's more of a long, long game when, you, yeah. you know, when you're looking at a well, long-term you know, gamble sometimes. Yeah. And I think sometimes we might lose a lot of our key athletes because you know, a lot of time between 22 and 28 or 32 when maybe if you stick in it, like Rich Kana, I think he didn't run, he didn't make his Olympic team, or he made he missed the Olympic team in 96, but yeah. he got two bronzes in 97. He was quick right, after 96. Right, and he made the Olympic team in, two, was it, was it in 2000? 2000. 2000. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that was that was like seven years out of college, right? Right. Yeah. So, I think yeah, all that support. Now, before we wrap up and let you go, go coach your athletes today up yeah. at the Armory. Um, if you're a high school runner, or actually any type of runner, what's like the number one advice you would give any runner, whether they're... 50, 46 years old, just starting out, or they're, 
you know, sixth grade or their dad's, you know, telling them to do laps because they, you know, they didn't do their chores or whatever. But any like r life l lessons with running, um, this, you know, could be one or two kind of yeah. inspirational points or, or, or advice you might give yeah, before we two, end. Two things. One is, is to always be building uh, like volume, but do it very slowly. You know, like, you know, you want to build every year in high school, every year in college, but do it in a, in a very uh, meticulous manner where, where you're not jumping up from like 50 miles a week to 80 miles a week, going right. up slowly. And, and that, you know, I think that's important. And number two, I think working on, when you're younger, working on fundamentals, um, drills and that sort of thing. And I, I don't know, I think they do it more now than, than when I was running. But it's something that at an early age, if you learn how to run correctly, right. you know, it's like, you know, it's like a golf swing, you know, right. you know, you'll have that the rest of your life. And when you get older, that kind of stuff is important to my age. You know, I'm lucky I, I had pretty decent uh, biomechanics when I was when I was younger. But, right. uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people don't. And, and that's something you need to work on when you're younger. Um, I think part of this actually, you know, it's not specializing too early. Yeah, yeah. You know, like yeah. even playing basketball I, and, and I honestly ball. think I honestly think um, basketball helped me with my running. It's it's constant plyometrics. And in, in, in seventh grade, I was actually like the high jump uh, county champion. You know, and I, I don't know if that came from like playing basketball, but right. but I think it's definitely helpful in running. You know, with that elasticity of your Achilles and your calf, and and uh, you know, really really something that helps out. I think that's great advice. You got to start. You got to start where you're at, and then and be patient about it. Be whether patient, you're yeah, patience, yeah, patience, yeah. Twelve years old or, or forty six years come. old. Let the fitness come to you. you right. know, don't chase it. Right. Well, John Trauman, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, John. Uh, I could talk to you all day about <laughs> this. Uh, again, my name is John Hunterkamp, and uh, you can find me at runcamp.com. I do all things running, and I have to thank our friends at the Manhattan Neighborhood Network and Will Sanchez for hosting us today. Thanks a lot for having me, John.